Hello and welcome to the Couch Coop Emporium. I am Couch Coop and we're looking at the top roguelike local co-op games. Now let's just look at this definition. The stuff in the blue, we're kind of going to ignore. <laughs> There's not too many turn-based or grid-based games in here. Be it a stipulation for the genre, it's also got a sub-sub-genre where they just sort of grab the bits that they want from the description of a roguelike and sort of implement them in cool double a and indie games we're gonna look at a whole bunch of them there's a lot of them out there and they're all really expertly priced i.e not massively expensive first one we got is of course a game called remy law It's kind of a two-player cutesy hack and slash. But the game features a lot of food. You are playing as two chefs and the emphasis is on, and this is a cool angle, the weapons. The weapons are crazy. You pick up scissors, you pick up brooms, swords. It does get traditional hammers. The combo ratio changes. The button input is not standard and you've got specials. There's a time slowdown on one of the characters. You can start jostling out loadouts almost. It is pretty cool, but it's kind of shallow but very pretty and nice sounding going ham with a spatula on a large killer robot with the couch co-op buddy wielding a broom to like anime sounds and this gorgeous art style doesn't really get too boring you see i think the couch co-op kind of saves this and the other levels are really cool the run systems there and there's a great layered progression system Okay, it's time for Rogue Stormers. Now you might be aware of my list system. I do start with a weaker material, but this list is kind of stonk full of really high class indie two player roguelikes. And this is definitely one of them. It's a four player as well. And it's got that 3D firing arc. I kind of fiddly jump on one of the R buttons, a little bit like Neon Abyss, but it's got a trading system. It's got a currency system. It's got a very good procedural generation setup almost a boss re-roll, sometimes you get mid-level bosses, but it's fresh and for its age, this kind of was well ahead of its time. It's got that Dead Cells perk unlock table, which is full of question marks at the beginning. Once you start playing it more, things start popping in and you get to see that you're opening up better drops the more you experience the game. And it does very well on level variation, putting you in all kinds of quite dramatic locations, but it's, it's its push when things get difficult that I love. The firing system is 360 degree arced and you get a hotkey special, which kind of slots out depending on what you've found during that playthrough. It can be a melee attack, which is very important. And it's got a wolf based theme because we're both playing as the starter character. There seems to be massive differences with the play styles, look, sound and everything for the other characters. I think there's about four or five of them. So these moves are all very tailored to the wolf guy, which is great. I think it's so good. One of the staples for a decent roguelike is opening up cool new characters, a huge incentive to hit that start button again. Rogue Stormers does that brilliantly and so do a lot of other games coming up. Neurovoider, I had to Google the crap out of that because this footage has not got any of the title screens on there. Colleen can't remember the names of these games sometimes because it could be Nero, Mansa, Crypt of the Dancing, Necro, Nero, you, you, your brain starts playing tricks. This is the ultimate, should have been on my twin stick list, Shooter, which has got like a builder robot vibe to it where you bolt on different sights, different arms and guns to make your little dude just that little bit more formidable. It's very good, I love this retro style and the explosions and it's hectic pace. It's got a very tech noir soundtrack and color palette right there's loads of neons here they've gone for a very particular look and vibe and i was so knocked about we both were at the amount of depth put in to the unlock screen between levels just like a cool road like you get the chance to add something to your character build and it even gives you the opportunity to test fire some of the weapons that you're going to bolt on to your little robot that's goddamn amazing 
I reviewed this quite some time ago and what stuck out for me is how well it will adapt to four players and how obvious that is as an implemented game model because you've got the room and you've got the space and there's enough enemies and of course this engine is going to cope with just about everything blowing up at the same time. What I will say is it's a bit stingy on panning out and it doesn't really, you're locked and that can be a bit of a problem running the other player off screen. If you want to take this roguelike seriously, I totally recommend the one player, it's deep as hell, it's a damn good roguelike on its own two legs. <laughs> That soundtrack and that upgrade system and its fluidity with how much is going on and the simplicity of the look of everything, how your objectives are mapped out to you, the procedural generation of the size of the areas that you explore is top notch. This is so recommended. Battle Planet is a twin stick which has got this Mario Galaxy vibe where your levels are a sphere and you are completely autonomous because of the split screen. It's such a hectic little rogue like this and yes it obeys all of those beautiful tropes with the permadeath, reroll systems, loads of perk drops and a trader between levels but it's again the game's speed. beautiful design of all the enemies there's an insectoid slash cyborg thing going on and of course these planets look awesome bits can blow up on them there's a green one you can jump around on a jetpack or do the slide if you're the other character there's quite a lot going on with battle planet it will sort of mix up two different game modes one of which is just eliminate all of the enemies on that ball bag you're fighting on or the other one is go and defuse these bombs and it's all about staying in and around that bomb allowing it to defuse it's the same system when you revive somebody so it's all about staying still being something you need to do and the game mechanic being something that will not let you do it's a great duality There's three unlockable characters, two of which you're seeing here, and the third one looks really crazy. He's got like a silhouette and he seems to be quite robotic looking. And there's also a trader that allows you to buy drops that appear in your runs. So it's not like you have a new starter weapon or anything else like that. You just increase the ratios of the chances of cool stuff appearing in your game. That's quite an important mechanic and it will be coming up a lot in the games on this list. The procedural generation aspect of it all is not going to blow your mind because you can only have that much variation on these smaller planets but you definitely see a different layout and it's basically mixing up those two objectives and throwing in cool bosses here and there that keep it extremely spicy and it's difficult. Man, it's very difficult. It takes a long time to realize your range and that you can actually reach halfway around these planets, but you can't see what you're shooting at. So you do have to keep moving and the jetpack is very liberating. You can get over obstacles, go and help your buddy out if they get taken down. Freaky Awesome is up next. It's a very good indie game with an extremely recognizable art style. This one's kind of a bit special. You're reluctantly transformed into a bunch of mutations that can actually randomize and unlock, but you basically got a giant insect and a strange dude with a tongue. That's normally the loadout, and you're just struggling to deal with the situation, get through this awfully difficult first level. There's a lot of explosive barrels, but everything starts coming together after you get that first boss, when you start getting cool new mutations, and you know what your freaky character is capable of. Pounding music, absolutely distractingly loud and pounding music. It kind of goes with the vibe. I don't actually mind it too much. The game is quite rough and ready also. It, it works well with the art style and some of the bosses and the creatures that you're fighting. Really grotesque stuff, perfectly animated as well. It's quite a lot of love has gone into this game. There's an almost slightly competitive feel with the end of level roundup, seeing what everyone got and did, special keys that get you into cool chests and everything goes towards making you more strange, more frightening powers and just becoming as much of a scary monster as the things you're fighting.
Next up we got Lost Castle. This one's really particular. It's one of my favorites. It's quite new for me as a purchase and it's got a lot of stuff happening in the right directions when it comes to an awesome local two player co-op roguelike. So randomization on character class is quite big here. A little bit like Rogue Legacy. And another thing it's good at is creating a sense of ownership within the hub. The hub will give you so much more if you give the game time, you get new weapon chests to open, you'll start levels with loads more food. Everything just starts opening up at the right speed with this game. I actually don't mind the way it looks. Because it's a beat em up slash range game, mixing up those lanes and using each other's specials as an advantage is just so important and it works brilliantly with two people. It also seems to be quite self-aware and funny. Its art style is not too serious and it plays on the fact that it's a roguelike game giving you some quite cool one-liners and explanations to why you keep coming back as somebody else and of course it's difficult and deep. You've got a lot of bosses coming in, things change up all the time. It's such a great idea to have this amount of variety pumped into a system that even if it was a campaign setup would be excellent. That's the idea here, is that there's so much more longevity in these games than a standard mapped out level after level campaign. And this one has got so many strengths in that area. <laughs> Yes, of course, you don't do a list like this without Nuclear Throne being right smack bang in the middle. Just gonna put a link in the description. We had an awesome Let's Play from We Heart Co-op. They gave this game an hour and a half, man. It's so hard. I might have to turn the screen jerk off. Twin Stick to the Hill, did it go on that list? Of course it didn't, it's a little bit older. Obviously I'm pulling everything in from like the last five, almost seven years. So this thing is basically an essential purchase for anybody who loves the roguelike genre, can play a Twin Stick and doesn't mind dying all the time and wants to see some of those amazing unlocks and character openings. There's some really cool characters in this. Ammo conservation is really important and weapon drops are absolutely amazing and you get little spawned in mini bosses that have got their own intros. I kind of love this game to bits, it's pretty timeless, it's still going. 2015 was its Steam release, can you believe? So it's got to be doing something right if it's still at the front of queues and getting played on loads of cool channels and it's, it warms my cockles to think that Nuclear Throne is, is not going to go away. Be warned though, some people are just not gonna like it. It's quite crude, loud, and shaky, and you've gotta know your twin stick stuff because everything happens at 200 miles an hour. But it's a good speed to be playing a rogue like that. So next up, it's Next Up Hero, and those graphics, it's like going from gravel to strawberries, right? That's a big jump. This one is kind of new, I think it's like 2019, and apologies to the regulars, this might be a repeat because it was on my recent five more, and I've tried to sort of shine a light on it a bit, because it's a great roguelike ARPG. Now, it's really about procedural generation and server maps and just some weird shit going on with bringing in randoms who have died, who were AI controlled. There's like eight different starter characters that are vastly different, look different, have massive specials that vary and synergize with each other. And then everything can have its own two slot of perk put into it, which are gathered through killing a particular type of enemy. You just want to keep playing because you want to keep bolting on new moves or upping your character's XP to get it to a prestige mode, which opens the door to a whole new set of defense items. It's huge. I cannot stipulate that enough. This is one of the most detailed roguelikes I've played in a very, very long time. I will say it's a little bit weird on the second player. The second player is great. They have no differences to yourself, but they join after you've started a map and none of that progression is actually saved on that character. So it's a little bit like you have a deck and you get everybody XP'd up and you kind of loan a character out to the person that's joined you, which is cool. It gives you an incentive to play it on your own. And when you've got that person round, they hit the ground running with a, a high level, awesome looking character. 
And I think that might be a key word here. I'm so into the way this game appears, is animated, and plays as a twin stick ARPG. It's got it all in the right place, and it's got a lot of reasons to pick up that pad and play with somebody else. It's great to be able to get as far as you can on a lot of these procedurally generated worlds. There's loads of choice with them. Well worth a look. Swords of Ditto, at Murrow's Curse, it's a new addition on the DLC, it's kind of on the base game, but you don't get to it until you've eaten your way through a lot of that initial content. It's kind of a Groundhog Day theme with this one, with everything sort of happening again and again, and you're in a cool village, there's loads of characters. It's one of my favourite couch co-op games, out of the roguelike sphere even. Beautiful art, loads of care, massive inventory system, and just a joy to play with somebody else. There's quite a few nods to loads of classic games, Zelda being one of them, and the combat isn't simple. Of course, there's the sticker system, which gives you massive perks. There's even a Loco Roco quest in here that allows you to get the roll system from that game. So much love has been spread around this little village as well with all the gazoo themed travel. We don't think everybody is a fan of. It's also quite full on with its combat and it loves its numbers. Rankings, you can see the different level of enemies here, loads of different types as well. And you can jostle range and melee combat very naturally. You can also build a character that specializes in directions and having someone else with you that can support you and beat up an enemy that's about to attack you from the back. Bit of a true dungeon crawler as well, giving you massive puzzles that are underground in big temples and crypts. And it does emphasize going on that roguelike adventure down a dungeon that has permadeath in it that you haven't been down before that is definitely procedurally generated. That I have a lot of time for. The element and blight system is really cool in the combat. You saw that the acid was dousing and following the player around and of course it's got a great day and night cycle which works quite well with a lot of the areas and spooky characters this game is steeped in a kind of dark souls mystery as well with npcs giving you key clues to what's going on and how you're going to end this cycle of the end of days almost coming to this poor little village <laughs> Yeah, I know, I'm not gonna talk about it for too long, don't worry, Project Starship X is kind of featuring pretty damn high on this list because it's, I think it's the only shoot em up roguelike I own and of course its madness is next to nothing else I own either. <laughs> You can't equal its sound and look. The aspect ratio itself and what they've done with the side panels and the look on the faces of the characters when they take hits, the unbelievable patronizing text that comes up when you die or pause. I'm still in the tutorial, the game tells me that tongue in cheek and of course getting these vehicles and having to get out of them and back into them every time this was just, as I say, madness. Its layered progression comes in the form of unlocking different ships. It's not very big on power up or special weapon drops that are outside of what that particular level would offer you anyway. There's not a huge table of icons that have got question marks on them, but there is a big emphasis on how the different characters play with their health. And there's also a bomb item, but it's great to have quite a flat playing field and just a very interesting game mode. The shoot em up mode is kind of pretty revolutionary because it will change up so much on this re-roll talking side scrolling sometimes you go on the ground and then you're back in the ship again it's it keeps you guessing ridiculously well <laughs> It's also one that I would 100% recommend as a single player game also. I'm again still being surprised by what levels I get to see and what power ups happen to me and of course some of the boss fights. There are so many random weird things that come up in this game and I got a level the other day which is 
flying against the side of the sun. I haven't even seen that. I'm probably about 25, 35 hours into it. Just on the PlayStation 4 version. Again, this is one for the Switch also. <laughs> I actually nearly forgot about Enter the Gungeon. It kind of wrote the book on two-player amazing co-op roguelikes and it's a game I go back to time after time because it has just not got boring with age. If anything, it's become more of a gem as time's gone on because we realize how amazing these mechanics are with two people and this reroll system, the map teleportation, the amazing bosses and the way they reroll out, there is so much to make you keep playing this game. Its relentless gun theme is also totally awesome and it's got a Risk of Rain style palette of unlocks that I will never get to the end of. I still pick up weapons in this game, I've had it for five years and I've never seen them before. They change everything up, they make you smile, it just produces so well on that reroll algorithm and I think they changed it up a bit for the Switch. I play this on the Switch quite a lot and it's a hell of a lot easier. Its soundtrack is pretty damn standout as well and it's got a great invincibility window on the roll button which can be utilized to such an advantage but it is quite a daunting thing to go into this game without realizing that it's kind of bullet hell and you are trapped in the almost contained environment just about every time. You've put Colt Canyon above Enter the Gungeon, have you? Well, yeah, this boy always say with this, gotta keep it fresh, gotta keep it new. This one, not enough light is shone on this at all. It's a great game over on the PlayStation. Network is very cheap, it's very new, and it's doing things in the direction of the roguelike model so well, including brilliant procedural generation, some excellent twin stick and permadeath mechanics. Not much of a dungeon crawler, but you are following this train track <laughs> through the Wild West. This one, again, all about the characters. You basically got a whole stage of different people to get into and unlocked, including Simon and Squidgy characters with bow and arrows, right down to a big dude with loads of health who's got the shotgun, which I'm using here. And it's a very different game, being able to take more than a couple of hits. But of course, it's ammunition is as rare as rocking horse shit. You will run out or be reloading 90% of the time. I think the procedural generation are probably one of the major strengths of how this game looks, along with its palette, and of course the weapon drops and where they are, and the camp placements of the enemies just can become so random, you can never come up with a plan every time you walk into that next level. It has a very strange idea with upgrades, on the fly upgrades in particular, they'll be at a station. The game doesn't stop whilst you're going into this vendor, which is a classic tradition for this genre, but it's the weirdness of it all. You can actually get a non-player character to follow you around, so there's three of you, and again, the placements of those perks totally change everything. It's really great to see a game subtly change things, but have huge implications on the end game play style. Okay, from here on in, it's kind of big boy territory, and of course, Don't Starve Together, which is the PlayStation 4 version, comes with some pro enhancements, and works brilliantly on the 5. This is a survival game, let's get that out there, but it's got some of the best procedural generation, and of course, it was there from the beginning, with the idea of having an online server-based map, and of course, it being different every time you fire the game up. This game kind of got me into watching Let's Plays on the internet because it was so funny to see how badly wrong things can go and how much communication needs to be put about each player. There's a very interesting PvP mode that you can play locally, but you could look over to the other screen and see what they're up to. Basically, you're crafting and you've got to get your crap together before the evening comes because there's ghosts and ghouls out in the darkness. 
these different elements or things that are used to start building are found all over the map and you have to jump through various hoops to get them. It's a great idea. You see the similar system in a game like Ark or anything else on the survival vein, but to have this couch co-op and all that awesome procedural generation and have a few little dungeons in there, it's certainly one for the roster. Oof, okay, I'm gonna let you into a little secret. Not all of these games were captured with two people, okay? Binding of Isaac had to be one I did on my own today because again, I had a bolt up right in the middle of the night moment and realized this was not a damn list. And it's probably one of the most famous couch corp roguelikes out there. This kind of broke the mold, made the mold and broke the mold. Fantastic game. It's room clearing of the highest degree and of course that classic map system has been blueprinted by just about every other game on this list. What I mean is just seeing them as cells up in the top corner and having access to different points at different times, certain doors require things to get through and you just have to clear the whole floor out. But the Binding Advisor also kind of wrote the rule book on pickups and stacking perks. It is crazy on getting new additions to your firing mechanism or movement, and they all have a brilliant visual appeal. You might have a big bump on your head where you've got an extra piece of life. The game keeps giving in that direction so well. It is a market leader, and you're talking eight years at the top of its game. Also, after owning the game for nearly a decade, realise that you can just respawn the other player back in. If you've got a spare heart, you just push options and they just drop straight in. But if you've got half a heart, it doesn't happen. I didn't clock that. I've normally only got half a heart. To try and blag it with two pads and one person is just not doable. That shows the caliber of how on the ball you've got to be. There's two ways to cheat by having a two player game with just one of you sitting there and that's to concentrate on one pad at a time or do what I like to do and that's to do a really crap job on both pads because your brain kind of falls over. Not recommended, but The Binding of Isaac is recommended. I just apologize about the quality of the footage. We're coming up to some of the best now. Blimey Couch Coop's done a list without Children of Mortar being at number one. It was one of the most difficult decisions I had to make. You all know how I love this game and of course what it did for me as a couch co op and the whole of the PlayStation 4 time period was it just reassured me that there's good developers out there with a good idea about what we want and they know how to implement it. Straight up the person playing this was like this game is just stunning looking they've never seen or played it before and I was like you're bang on it is perfect looking. Again some of these titles this has clearly got a massive amount of love behind it. But it does not stop there. This game's ARPG merits are some of the best in the industry. When I hold this up against big AAA titles like Diablo or Chaos Bane, this is still really good in areas. It's procedural generation has got to be one of the massive things about it, but it's on the fly pickups and that skill tree make it so interesting. <laughs> This is also that Family Trials footage. So this, this is the new DLC, which is a bit like the survival mode on Remnant from the Ashes. They've pushed everything in from the game into a huge reroll circle. Could be different world, different level, and different enemies within those levels. Everything has got mixed up even more, and it's a real perfect bin to just dip into because you're gonna get a different thing every single time, but you're familiar with it all, but just not it being in that order. <laughs> This is not even touching the fleshed out character difference and the play styles from the five different family members, might be six, is massive. It's like having mini games. It's unbelievably cool how the range support specials work in conjunction with the close quarters characters, but there's also a bunch of different types of them, including a quick aggressive one, a slower, larger damage dealing dude. Excellent, excellent game design and just so much to get your teeth into. And as a couch co-op game, doesn't get better because there's too much going on for you guys to be distracted with what the other person's doing but at the same time the synergies just come together on screen you know exactly what's going on and when it's happening <laughs> yep 
Yeah, Fury Unleashed. We're going to finish up with Fury Unleashed, and there's a few reasons why I've picked this for the top of the list. First one being, it's kind of a Contra clone that plays so well as a single player, it doesn't even bear talking about. When you start putting two people on screen and adding all of these pickups and on-the-fly buffs and different awesome weapon types that sound and look amazing, things start moving in a whole new direction. Then we start talking about its platforming aspects. It's a really difficult game technically to get over some of the sections and we haven't even got to the boss re-rolls that unlock screen is pages long this game is everything we want from a couch co-op roguelike Let's talk very quickly about its controls because it's so fast and furious with its dash button that can be implemented mid-air, mid-jump, on the ground. It's kind of a Mario style, allows you to avoid smaller gaps, but it's how you get your head around using that in conjunction with firing and jumping and going through platforms. The camera just keeps up with you perfectly. And with two people, this just intensity increase. Now let's go over its kind of comic book aesthetic and art style. It's flawlessly beautiful with its enemy design and hazards designs, explosions, element and blight effects. The bosses are grotesque and massive. A lot of time's been put into making this like an aztec -y cool skeleton, Temple of Doom level almost. Brilliant stuff in that direction. Then we get to what's going on with the pickups and it is an on the fly random drop system but you also have an upgrade tree that couples with a weapon unlock and equipment unlock screen. So you've just got question marks everywhere, new stuff happening every time you pick up that pad. It draws you in with so much urgency. It's, it's groundbreaking. There's also one game that didn't quite make the list and it is Streets of Rogue, which is over on Game Pass, that came off Game Pass. So I was like, I fired it up the other day, 16 pounds please. I was like, Christ, it will just have to wait. So apologies for not including that. It's kind of namesake suggests it all. I will put the link into a five more video that it featured on. I also think this might have been one of my longest, biggest lists of all time. And of course, Thank you for sticking with me till the end. It's my 2022 first couch co-op list, so I really appreciate it. And of course, the PB!